So, who did this work? Um, because we were um, thinking that a lot of the work on structural transformation is being done at the macro level, and we were seeing a very uh, more nuanced picture when we worked with household survey data. So we thought, okay, let's look at this question of structural transformation uh, from the point of view of households and household portfolio and see what kind of picture that gives us uh, in comparison to what you get from the macro side. So I think there's been a lot of discussion on structural transformation. Um, I can probably uh, uh, skip this overview, except uh, here's the point, is that it's usually measured, focusing on sectoral productivity. And so our approach is to really um, look at the non-wage sector, because that's where most of the employment is. And the classic idea of structural transformation from Lewis was that people move out of the family production or non-wage sector into the modern sector with uh, wage employment. And um, it's true that in many countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially non-resource rich countries that have had rapid growth, the wage sector is expanding rapidly, but it's coming from a very low base, and so, uh, and the labor force is growing rapidly, so it's not really um, employing that many people. So it's likely for the next 20 years that the non-wage sector is going to continue. And does that mean that kind of structural transformation in Africa is, uh, is doomed? And our answer is no. Um, that structural transformation in Africa will incorporate the household enterprise sector as productivity rises in these uh, household uh, self-employment, household enterprise, micro-enterprises. Now, this will not uh, provide the same spillover effects, for example, as private investment in large enterprises. Large enterprises are still, uh, modern enterpri the modern enterprise is still one of the most efficient uh, economic organizations known to man and woman. But it will, our argument is that it will um, allow people to access higher productivity opportunities in the economy. And it will lead to improvements in income and inclusive growth. Okay, so Uganda uh, is a country that has had two decades of growth and output transformation. And um, so um, during those two decades, uh, aggregate productivity in the economy uh, grew substantially, even though the labor force was growing at 3% per annum. So yet output per worker um, uh, increased by about 70%. So 60%, um, something like that. So it was really a good, um, a, a good period. Um, here's what it looks like in the trends. Um, this is the overall trend of, econ the solid line is the trend of overall economic growth. And you can see agriculture over this period declining as a share of GDP. What's interesting is that after about, um, let's see, after really uh, about uh, two, the early 2000s, you know, the kind of the picture got pretty confident. I mean, there are a few bumps, which may really be related to terms of trade changes or something, but um, the picture is kind of pretty much the same, which is sort of interesting in terms of shares. And what that means is that all of the, um, and, and yet there was a solid growth, so what that means is that all the sectors were growing at uh, uh, pretty much the same rate, uh, but there was productivity improvements. Um, okay, so then employment transformation also happened, but it's not quite as dramatic as the output transformation. This is not a surprise because we know that uh, from work by Timmer and others that the output um, transformation always leads the employment transformation. Um, so actually the absolute number of people working in agriculture uh, did increase over this period even though the share um, declined. Um, and this, sh this was a solid growth, this share of the industry, uh, of people working in industry doubling. And this is not mining because at this time uh, uh, Uganda did not, has. Uganda has an oil sector coming, but at this time it didn't have it. So this is real, this is construction, this is a small manufacturing sector, um, and, uh, and then of course, serve, like many other countries, services grow. 
private sector services and public sector services. Now, what kind of jobs were created? So our, we broke this down and our analysis shows that um, mostly these were uh, not wage jobs. Most of the new jobs outside of the agriculture sector were created by households. So uh, by people working for themselves or their families, employing very few workers, um, uh, something like uh, only 50, in about 2000, only less than 20% employed any workers at all outside of the family, even on a casual basis. Um, in industry um, and services, there was substantial growth in the wage sector. Uh, the manufacturing um, did not absorb that much of the labor force. Um, and, but in the non-wage, the growth was uh, generally higher. Um, and here's a picture of that graphically. Um, okay, so what did that mean? Uh, in the end for um, uh, the economy for income growth. Okay, oh, my goodness, sorry about that. Uh, I, I don't know, I can't, I don't, at this point I don't think I can get rid of that upper corner of the rural area showing twice. <laughs> it looked okay on my tablet. Um, but basically what, what you really see, we can focus on the rural areas because this is the same as this. Um, what you're seeing here, maybe it's clear in this color scheme, is that what people were doing was adding an income. So in Uganda, um, about over 40% of people reported a second job. Uh, many of those people reporting a second job worked in agriculture, either as their first job or their second job. So these numbers over here that we saw, this is, this is primary employment, okay? This is only assuming they have only one job. This is primary employment. And it's these numbers on primary employment that are underlying all of the macro numbers that were presented in the previous session on um, structural change. So all the numbers from Ghana, all the numbers from Maggie McMillan, all of those aren't counting people's second job. Okay, but when we start to look at it from a household uh, level, what we see is that uh, over this, um, here, this is 15 of the 20 years, um, we see that basically those, in rural areas especially, those people who were in farming stayed in farming. This is nationwide, you see the same thing down here. So many, many households stayed in farming. Some got out. Um, this is as a share of total households. So. Uh, what you have is um, perhaps some households moving in as well. But what they did is they added an income. They added a wage income, they added a non-farm enterprise income, uh, they added a public sector, although the public sector wage employment is much smaller than private sector wage employment, it's much less important in household incomes, it's much less spread out among the households. And there was also a growth of people working in agriculture wage. Agriculture wage is um, the lowest paid activity, people earn even less there than in family farms in Uganda, and uh, this is generally true around the world that agricultural wage is uh, not the best activity. You can see in all of Uganda there was a faster growth of private non-agricultural wage here, and uh, even bigger growth in the non-farm enterprise. Um, okay, so this is a picture of people's portfolios, their household portfolios. So the way this was constructed is if anybody said either I have a primary or secondary activity in farming or non-farming or whatever, it got counted as an activity. So in this type of household, everybody works on a family farm. Nobody even does agricultural wage labor. So they're totally specialized in agriculture. Um, this represented a majority of the households in 1992. But by 2005-06, it was down to uh, 30 percent um, of people that were specialized. Interestingly enough, that 30 percent was a very um, kind of a mixed group. There were people who were specialized and quite poor, and there were people who were specialized and doing reasonably well off. So there was some transfer transformation going on in Uganda. There are debates about agricultural productivity growth, lots of debates about that. 
uh, labor productivity growth um, about the date and whatever. But it's uh, it's clear that there there were um, there was some commercialization, so you got specialized farmers and some not. But then you have all these other sectors here um, that grew a lot, like this one is agricultural wage and family farm, and that grew with the expansion of agricultural wage. Um, and um, this one is a family farm and uh, non-farm enterprise, and this uh, grew as well. And um, then, um, and all these other small ones are different combinations. We have, uh, obviously, with uh, five different, with uh, 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 four different um, uh, types of work, we can get 16 different combinations, so you have a few slivers there, there and then. Um, but this, was, uh, this is in the rural areas only. We showed, uh, we showed it just in the rural areas. We have it also in the urban areas done as well. Um, and actually in the urban areas, there's still a number of people who have one foot in agriculture and one foot in household enterprises or wage work. Okay, so what did that do? in terms of incomes and, um, and poverty and structural change. Well, we argue that this was an important part of the poverty reduction story and that it represents this portfolio shift into more activities represents an important part of the structural change. In the first place, we show that um, two jobs means less underemployment. Now, these data are on just on the rural areas, average hours worked in the past month. And what you can see is that if agriculture is your only activity, you tend to work a few hours. You tend to only work a few hours, right? Um, but if you have another activity besides that, uh, not women, because many women who are working in agriculture are also doing a lot of household work, and, and so they don't have the hours to add any more activities because they're looking after kids or whatever. But men, uh, when they add another activity, they work, 28% um, more, although this is still not full time. Um, those who are employed in, um, who are in self-employment, who have one only self-employment, these are specialized in self-employment, they work the most and they tend to be doing the, quite well and the ones that combine it also work a lot of hours. So if this person could have a self-employment, these people could uh, have less underemployment. So that's another aspect of the structural change. It is, if you will, part of a Lewis transformation in that people who were underemployed are now uh, more fully employed. Even if these are low productivity activities, um, they are st uh, um, the earnings, uh, especially the, because they can work more hours, the earnings tend to be higher than in um, self family farming. Okay, so. What, then we tried to analyze the impact on household welfare and poverty and what we did was we did a consumption regression. We didn't look at income per se because um, there are a lot of errors in the measurement of non-wage income and our argument that is that those errors are actually uh, correlated with your outcome of uh, total income or of, uh, so if you have total income on one side and then you have type of income um, on the other side, uh, your errors in, in, in the total income are correlated with the type of income. So you don't have um, a, uh, a regression that you can use. So we used household consumption uh, where the errors shouldn't be correlated with the type of income you have. Um, and so we did a regression um, I'm, the, the whole regression is in our paper that's on the website. I'm just going to show you the part on household sources of income. We controlled for the average, for the level of education in the household and the household demographics, the age uh, of the head and the number of children, et cetera, and where you were located and whether you were in a conflict zone and um, some other um, uh, things we we used uh, we controlled for when the data what month the data were collected and adjusted et cetera and the consumption was adjusted spatially and so all of that okay so now the red numbers are the numbers that I'd like you to focus on so the first thing is we just had a dummy variable yes or no what kind of income you have and we included remittances here on this one now what this shows is that first of all starting in urban areas in urban areas. Um, 
wage income, this is all wage income, formal and informal, right? So this is, you know, your cushy public sector job, your non-cushy public sector job, as well as your day labor job and your private sector job. So here, what's interesting is that um, con when you control for education, people actually do better, some people actually do better in household enterprise sector than in the wage sector. And that's because there are many people that don't have the minimum education to get a wage job. Um, or if they get one, they can only get a very poorly paid day labor job, so they're actually better off here. So um, our argument is that the development of this sector, and you see that in rural areas as well, although this wage income, non-farm wage income is pretty low, um, but, of but the agriculture is uh, quite low, especially farm wage income, uh, quite low, although uh, we, we have some in urban areas that's not uh, significant. And so um, basically, um, uh, and this is even better than receiving a remittance. Um, so this already shows that to the extent that um, earnings are uh, both productivity and hours worked, um, this, sh this shows that this kind of structural transformation that we observe uh, is making a difference. Now here we have some of our portfolio categories like I showed you. And here the base category is just the family farm, that, that about one quarter of the people who are just family farmers. So here um, the non-farm enterprise uh, story again is good in rural areas and urban areas. Um, but actually, our, what I call our super portfolios down here, uh, family farm and household enterprise and everything, uh, I guess this number's not coming out, but it was, uh, it's 448, our, our super portfolio is, uh, is pretty good. And actually in urban areas, family farm and non-farm wage income um, does better than just wage income just everybody in the household getting a wage. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and, um, and also family farm and uh, household enterprise does pretty well as well. Um, so one reason why this one does well is of course if you have a wage earner then it's easier to get access to credit. Um, so I think the uh, wage earner effect being combined in the urban areas is especially uh, perhaps giving you access to credit, although that um, needs to be explored some more. So basically our um, conclusions are um, that if your um, expanding higher productivity sectors do not uh, absorb a lot of labor, the employment transformation is going to be slow or non-existent. So if, for example, you're in a resource-rich uh, economy and your industry, industrial sector is expanding because it's primarily mining, which is not creating any jobs, you can have an increase in aggregate productivity in industry, but you're not actually getting the employment transformation. And that's one of the reasons why inequality is increasing in many of the uh, resource-rich countries. Um, on the other hand, in, in East Asia, actually, uh, in some countries, in the initial period, um, uh, as they were, like in, uh, in, uh, in Vietnam, for example, when they were going from state enterprises to the more labor-intensive industries in the initial period, actually the agro-productivity in the industrial sector fell as employment grew very, very rapidly. And then it started to grow uh, along with um, output growth. And so, um, and in East Asia, during that period, you also had households shifting into household enterprise sector. What really struck me when I started looking at the aggregate numbers is that what makes Sub-Saharan Africa different from East Asia um, is not necessarily the share of the labor force in agriculture. Um, it's the aggregate productivity of that labor force. Vietnam still has 50% of its labor force working in agriculture. And you see in East Asia this household enterprise sector being an important part of the labor force, an important contributor to employment and earnings. But people don't talk it down the same way they talk about it in, um, in Africa. And I think that if, um, I think it's quite possible that um, some of the um, 
uh, pictures that people show about, well, you know, productivity is not expanding in these sectors, this is a problem. I mean, it might happen because the labor force is growing so big, but at the same time, the shift effect will be sp strong and you'll see aggregate productivity growth in the economy. Um, and if you're only focusing on primary employment, you may miss the shift in productivity which is occurring if you look at primary and secondary employment. So our argument is that if your focus of structural transformation policy is only on the wage sector, your policy is going to exclude the majority of households and your analysis is not going to really capture what's going on. So we argue that um, it's important to co uh, combine the macro uh, work on structural transformation with micro work at the household looking at the portfolio to see what's really going on. Okay, that's it.